Welcome to the second lecture on chapter 3.2. In this section, we will focus on the production and use of antibodies in protein detection and identification. The use of antibodies can extremely enhance our abilities to visualize a single protein within a mixture. Think about our SDS page gel from the following slide. It would be really hard to visually see a single protein from this complicated mixture and be confident that we are in fact viewing our protein of interest. If we can use an antibody to highlight where our specific protein might be, it can be a powerful tool to help us understand the structure and function of individual proteins within a system. There are several different types of antibodies that can be produced in vivo but the ones most commonly used in biochemical studies are the immunoglobulin type G antibodies, or IgG, as the one shown here. An IgG antibody molecule is composed of four polypeptides, two identical heavy chains, which are the large peptide units, shown here, that are partially bound to one another in a Y formation. They're held together by disulfide bridges, the Y formation is flanked by two light chains. Note that each IgG antibody contains two antigen binding sites at the ends of the Y. Antibodies can be raised to specific proteins of interest by exposing an organism to a non-native protein, causing them to have an immune response. For example, if a rabbit is injected with a human protein, that protein will behave as an antigen and cause the rabbit's immune system to generate antibodies that recognize the foreign protein. The rabbit will then generate memory B cells that can produce antibodies against the protein of interest, further challenging the rabbit with the second or third or even fourth exposure to the protein will increase the amount of free IgG antibodies that are then secreted from the memory cells. Collection of blood from the animal enables the purification of the secreted antibodies. Because most antigens are complex structures with multiple epitope or binding sites, they result in the production of multiple antibodies that recognize the same protein, but just different parts of that protein. Thus, the sera produced is said to contain polyclonal antibodies or a pool of antibodies that recognize different epitopes on the same protein. Polyclonal antibodies are very useful for many types of studies. However, some studies require that there's only a single or monoclonal antibody that recognizes a single epitope on the protein. It's very difficult to separate polyclonal antibodies from one another. Thus, monoclonal antibodies must be produced in a different way. As we will see, monoclonal antibodies are more complicated to produce. In this system, a mouse is repeatedly exposed to an antigen, or a protein of interest in this case, to cause the antibody response. This step is similar to what is seen in the production of polyclonal antibodies. However, at this stage, the animal is sacrificed and the spleen is harvested. The spleen cells are then hybridized with a myeloma tumor cell line that is immortal and will grow indefinitely in culture. This is unlike the normal spleen cells that are harvested from the mouse, which will die in culture. A special selection medium is then used to allow only the hybrid cells to grow. These cells are called hybridoma cells. The hybridoma cells contain polyclonal antibodies that recognize different epitopes of our protein of interest. Thus, to separate these cells, the cells are diluted so that only a single cell will make it into each culture vessel. Usually, several 96 well plates are used for this step. The single cells are allowed to grow out and each will produce only a single antibody with this specific epitope for the protein of interest. This is called a monoclonal antibody. The nice thing about this type of antibody is that it can be cultured and produced indefinitely, whereas polyclonal antibody production and composition can vary in between different host organisms 
and even within the same host at different times. Antibodies can be combined with our SDS page experiments to produce a new kind of experiment called the Western blot. There are several major steps within the Western blot. The first is sample preparation. This will be the same as for a normal SDS page gel. A protein lysate is prepared according to a purification scheme. And a small sample is then denatured by heating and the addition of SDS and DTT to ensure that the protein will migrate in the gel based on size. The samples are then loaded onto the gel. And a ladder of known protein sizes is also added into one of the wells. The proteins that are coated with the negatively charged SDS particles will run to the anode or the positive charge. Since the gel is very thin and hard to work with after it has been used to separate the samples, the proteins are then transferred from the gel to a hydrophobic membrane. This process is called blotting. Essentially, a sandwich is made with the gel and the membrane at the center and then surrounded by filter paper. It is then exposed to an electric current so that the proteins will leave the gel and get stuck in the membrane. The hydrophobic nature of the membrane keeps the proteins from moving beyond the membrane and into the filter paper. The proteins are then fixed in the membrane by exposing it to UV light. The UV light causes covalent cross-linking to occur between the proteins and the membrane. You can now rigorously wash the membrane and the proteins will not be dislodged. In steps 4 through 7, antibodies will be used to detect the protein of interest. First, the blot must be pre-treated to block non-specific protein binding sites inherent in the membrane. Non-fat dry milk is often used for this purpose. Then, a primary antibody, shown in orange, that is specific for your protein of interest, is incubated with the blot. It will bind to the blot only where your protein of interest is found. The blot is then washed gently to remove any unbound primary antibody, and a secondary antibody, shown in pink, is added to the blot. This antibody is specific for the heavy chains of antibodies and will bind to the heavy chain regions of your protein-specific antibody. This secondary antibody is also bound to a detection molecule. This detection molecule can have bioluminescence, chemifluorescence, radioactivity, or colored properties, such as immunogold, that will make it possible to detect the location. The blot is then exposed to film to detect the signal. The film on the left shows the results of a western blot, and the right shows the blot itself stained with kumasi blue. You can see the sensitivity of the antibodies that can very cleanly detect down to 0.1 nanograms of protein and allow visibility of the protein even within a crowded blot that has a dense mixture of proteins. Kumasi staining, on the other hand, can only detect 100 nanograms or above of proteins and is nonspecific. Enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assays, or ELISAs, offer another method of using antibodies to detect low levels of specific proteins within a lysate. Typically, this assay is done in a 96-well plate format and uses very small quantities of protein to mediate detection. ELISAs can be run in several different ways. In the first two methods, the direct and indirect ELISAs, protein lysates are coated and cross-linked onto the bottom of 96 well plates. In the direct ELISA, a single primary antibody specific for the protein of interest and also containing a chemiluminescent marker attached to the heavy chain is incubated with the sample. If the protein of interest is present, the antibody will attach. The well is then washed to get rid of any unbound and non-specifically bound antibody and then the detection solution is applied and the samples are monitored using UV-Vis spectrophotometry. The direct ELISA is the fastest protocol, but it can often suffer from high background.
An indirect ELISA can help decrease the background. This method is the same as the direct ELISA, except that the chemiluminescent detection system is attached to the secondary antibody, which recognizes the heavy chain of the antibody that is specific for your target protein. There are also sandwich ELISAs, where the primary antibody that recognizes your protein of interest is coated and cross-linked with the 96-well plate. The protein lysate is then incubated in the well, where it will bind tightly with the antibody. Another primary antibody that recognizes a different epitope of the target molecule is then incubated with the mixture. Wash steps remove any unbound protein or antibody in between each incubation. Then a secondary antibody is used to detect the presence of the primary antibody. Sandwich ELISAs have high specificity, but they require two different primary antibodies that bind to different epitopes of the protein. Sometimes this can be hard to find. The protocol is also much longer with more incubation steps. Competitive ELISAs use a known amount of antigen to coat and bind a 96-well plate. Primary antibody plus your protein lysate that contains your protein of interest is mixed together and then added into the well. The more antigen that's present in your protein lysate, the more it will compete with the amount of antibody that's also present in the well and the less antibody there will be to bind with the substrate that is covalently attached to the well plate. If you do a series of experiments like this with different concentrations of your protein lysate, it can be a useful way to help quantitate the amount of antigen present within the protein lysate. Here is an example of what a competitive ELISA might look like. You can see that no protein lysate is present on the left-hand side, and there is a lot of blue color created as the antibody binds to the known quantity of antigen that's coating the well. As higher concentrations of your protein lysate are added to the mixture, there is less and less antibody present to bind to the antigen protein that's cross-linked to the well plate. It is effectively being competed away by the protein of interest this could be useful to detect if your protein expression levels change in your cells of interest during different treatments, perhaps before and after a stress event like exposure to UV light. Another way to use antibodies in biochemistry is as a tool to help figure out where proteins are localized within a cell or a tissue. For this type of analysis, very thin slices of tissue are prepared and mounted onto glass slides where they are cross-linked or fixed onto the slide. The cells can then be permeabilized by treating them with alcohol or other solutions and then incubated with primary and secondary antibodies that is linked with a bioluminescent or chemiluminescent marker. The samples are then visualized microscopically for detection. Here are some different examples of staining patterns that can be observed. The top diagram has no staining with the antibody, whereas the bottom diagram shows nuclear staining at low and high magnification. This one shows membranous staining versus cytoplasmic staining. And this one shows differential staining with only the connective tissue and not the epithelial tissue below. Overall, the use of antibodies within biochemical research has opened up a whole world of cellular exploration that wasn't possible prior to their development. In the next section, we will take a look at methods for sequencing and synthesizing proteins.